Great. So um, welcome everyone to Finance Office Hours. This is a time where we've invited in an expert and invited you in so that you can connect and ask questions and um, talk about kind of concerns that you're having. Um, and so this is um, Shama Kanakor. Did I say it right enough? Yes, you did. <laughs> community vision and uh i'm gonna pass it over to her to talk a little bit about uh, about community vision and herself um can you hear me okay okay oh, hi everyone everybody else should be able to unmute themselves if they want so they could just talk and turn on their video they can ask questions and be involved go ahead Great. So my name is Shama Kanakor, and I'm a financial management consultant with Community Vision. Uh, Community Vision was formed more than 30 years ago. And uh, as you can see from the slide set, our mission is to promote economic justice and alleviate poverty by increasing the financial resilience and sustainability of nonprofits and enterprises. Uh, we have offices in San Francisco and Oakland and Fresno. But right now, as with everyone, we're all working from home. So in order to achieve our mission, we have different services, uh, one of them being lending. So the lending department provides uh, flexible lending to support uh, nonprofits and enterprises that are deeply rooted in low-income communities. And the different sectors that we provide financing for is affordable housing, community facilities, and food enterprises. We are also participating in what is called as the New Market Tax Credit Program, and we used our allocation to generate equity capital investing to support real estate projects, again, in low-income communities. Uh, we also have a socially responsible investing fund uh, wherein organizations and even individual investors can invest as low as $1,000 and the invested pool is put into nonprofits and social enterprises. And we also do policy work at the local, state, and national level through our CDFI affiliation. And uh, we also have a consulting uh, department, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So there are two sections in the consulting department. We have the real estate and the financial management consulting. So our real estate consultants work with nonprofits and social enterprises to develop their real estate strategies. And the financial um, consulting sector, we basically that I am a part of, we work on the financial management capacity building. And a little more in that, we do understand that, you know, all nonprofits are at different levels in their business model. Some of them are just starting out, while some of them are very established. And so we meet them where they are. So it could be uh, connecting a nonprofit to a bookkeeper or an auditor, or even doing a deep dive into their financial needs assessment. Uh, so we do that for them. Uh, we also, uh, during COVID, uh, came up with this rapid technical assistance program. So folks can go onto our website and schedule a 45 minute call with us, you know, uh, ask any real estate or financial uh, question and we support them and help them through that. Um, and uh, we also have a very interesting tool on the website. So, you know, organizations can download that tool, put in information, about their budget and you know different scenarios and help plan that. So having said all of that, I welcome all of you and look forward to participating in the session. Thank you, Shama. And um, as I said in the chat, feel free to unmute and put, turn on your video if you like, and um, you can get Shama's attention here, all, or you can also put questions or comments in the chat and I'll make sure that those get bubbled up. And this is really a time for you to ask your questions. Um, so let's see if there are any questions out there. If not, I can see some questions. Um, I'll, I'll just start asking one and see what happens, but please feel free to ask questions. Um, I've noticed, or we're, we're looking at, um, 
a grant that's being offered by California Department of Public Health that's a pass-through grant from the feds. And I actually know a lot of our partner organizations are considering this grant. It's a COVID response grant, but they need to bring up their accounting standards to be um, the kind of documentation that's needed for federal grants, which many of these organizations are, are partner organizations or community organizations and are not used to, for example, um, being able to document their indirect costs and things like that. And I was wondering if you had any um, experience or examples that might help folks. Um, sure. Um, so I have uh, come to notice that for a lot of nonprofits, um, there's not a, a deeper understanding of what is in that, what is the total cost of providing that particular service, right? So most often than not, what it's seen is that nonprofits would budget uh, putting in their personal costs and cost of even, you know, um, providing, uh, mostly it's the personal costs that go into it, but they don't take into consideration the indirect cost of say working in a building or you know, using uh, a machinery or so on and so forth. So what's what's important is that it's important. One needs to put into consideration the entire uh, work that's going to go into providing that service, be it personnel, be it equipment, be it supplies, uh, anything, even as simple as electricity costs, right? Because you're going to be sitting out of some place and working. So it's important to make sure that all the costs that you're going to incur for providing that service is included when you're writing for the grant. And once you do get a grant, make sure that you're putting in um, a documentation of all the expenses that you've incurred. Because what we want don't want happening is uh, people missing uh, out on putting in the documentation, uh, they miss out on putting in the receipts and all of that. So when an audit comes about, uh, there are missing pieces of information. So it's as simple as that. Say for example, my dad gives me an allowance of $100. I need to show him exactly where that money is going. And I also, before asking him for $100, I need to also tell him why I need that. So make sure that everything that I need, whatever expenses that's coming up for me is documented. So. That's what I have to say about indirect costs. Does that answer your question, yeah. Rachel? Oops, sorry, I was talking, I was posting into the chat a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a good start. I'm curious whether other people have follow-up questions or, or other questions that, burning questions about how to handle their how to up their financial game in their organization or um, problem solving. I see there are 20 of you here. <laughs> Anyone have a question? I was curious as to how people um, account for their costs. I mean, do they have uh, financial systems in place? Are they doing it on Excel or are they doing it on accounting software? Because a lot of softwares kind of uh, updated their, uh, you know, the kind of services that they provide. So for example, if it's a grant, then, you know, they provide options to, create different accounts for different grants so that all the accounting is in place. And so at the click of a button, you can actually create accounts for that particular grant. Um, of course, it depends on the budget of the organization as to how much they can uh, afford to you know, pay for these accounting services, uh, which is as simple as QuickBooks to you know, other more complicated and more um, individualized uh, accounting systems. If anybody's having trouble unmuting there, that you can just hit that little microphone in the in the corner of your of your Whova screen, um, and so they can join in. Um, just to say that we're using QuickBooks, CPEN is using QuickBooks, and we sometimes it, it works great in some ways. In other ways, we run into limitations, particularly with accounting for those different grants, sort of doing fund accounting, and so. Um, 
I don't know if other people are running into that problem as well and think about upgrading to something that allows them to track a little more carefully and not having to go back and forth between Excel and QuickBooks. Right, right. I think one of the um, things that can be included, actually it's a part of your um, long-term planning as well, is that, uh, you know, figure out how much of grants and how much of nonprofit uh, fund accounting you would need to do because you don't want to reach a situation where your you know capacity is done in like two, 12 months and then you'll have to create an entire new software or buy a new software so as to you know uh, make space for the new grants coming in and so on so if you do anticipate a lot of fund accounting then i would definitely recommend going in for those accounting systems that actually allow you to add modules as and when you grow Anybody else want to weigh in on, on kind of what they're doing with their accounting systems and what they're searching for? Such a quiet group. Um, do you have a recommendation of if somebody wanted to move up from Excel or QuickBooks, something that's kind of the next level up? Well, uh, since I joined the nonprofit world, I've been getting all these recommendations from, you know, I don't know, YouTube ads and stuff like that. But um, I don't know. Um, there's a Razor's Edge, uh, I think, uh, something that matches with that. Um, but off the bat, other than QuickBooks, uh, I'm not familiar with more than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about if, unless anybody has a question about um, adapting internal, is this something you could talk about adapting internal controls to being in a re remote environment and not being in the same office as other people to have that sort of separation of duties? Is that something you could talk about? Uh, well, when we move to a uh, technology related uh, environment, then all the internal controls will have to be on access to information. So, you know, it's all about who can access which information and what changes can be made. Uh, you know, for example, most organizations have a server where they have information stored, right? Who has access to that information? Can anybody go in and make any changes that they want? Uh, is there a trail of, you know, who is uh, entering or having access to that information? So it's mostly related to um, access to information and ability to change the data. Um, you know, that's the first part of control. So it's your password protections and your version changes, uh, which is documented on your uh application. So these are the two types of controls that would have to be introduced. And this would typically be introduced by your system administrator, your IT person, uh, because you and me sitting here won't be able to have any kind of control over the central database, right? So it's all about the IT person who has that ability to make the changes. Do you think it's easier or more difficult to be doing these kinds of um, internal controls now that everybody's doing things in a more remote environment? Yeah. Um, honestly, if it moves to a technical thing, it's more easier because uh, technical con automated controls are easier to control and test as compared to uh, physical control. Like, right? for example, you know. Uh, if you're not sitting in the office, then you know that everybody doesn't have access to all the donations that come in and so on. So you don't have to worry about that because there's nobody entering the office. But you know what you need to have control over is who is entering in the information into your QuickBooks on the amounts received and so on, right? So then you you have a control on that. And so once it moves to an automated uh, set, then your lower level controls don't have to be in place. So the higher level of control is when it's automated, when nobody has you know, accessibility to change things like that. But if it's more physical, that's more of a lower level control. 
So I would always say that if the more automated things are, the easier it is because all the controls are in one place. And once you test one of that, then you know that everything is working. Yeah, I agree. There's some ways that the internal controls are made easier by having a system that requires them. So Right, right. And the lesser number of people that have access to the process, the more uh, integrity is there in the process, if you get what I mean, right? So there are lesser number of points where people can go in and uh, change things and, uh, you know, I don't want to use the word mess things up, but change things intentionally, unintentionally, whatever the reason be. Uh, but the more automated it is, then the more control there is. So you know that not anyone can go in and change as and when they want to do that. Great. Thank you. Is there going to just open up again and see if there are any other questions that people are harboring about finances and um, budget scenario planning? Anything that they have, any burning questions they have in their minds? Everybody just wants to hear your wisdom. Just straight, straight from your mouth. <laughs> well, it, it's honestly it's difficult to just keep talking. I, know, I mean, I, know. I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, scenario planning. Let's talk about scenario planning. Right? What is scenario planning and why do we need to do that? Uh, let's say I expect I'm going to get three grants this year. And so I go ahead and make all these commitments for expenses, right? And one of the grants falls through. So what am I going to do? Um, I, I still have to meet all of the expenses. I don't have the money coming in from the third grant. So I'm going to be at a deficit at the end of the year. So scenario planning is nothing but, you know, at the beginning of the year, when you're doing your, your budget, you take all your revenue streams into account and then you assign a probability to it. Say, for example, grant one, um, let's say the probability is 100% and like 75 and 50 Grant two is like 80%, 50%, and 30%. So you actually assign a probability to each grant. And then you determine, you know, the best case scenario and the worst case scenario, right? So, and you kind of budget your expenses for each of the scenarios as well. And you want to make sure that uh, your expenses cover at least your most conservative, you know, scenario. So if you make more than that, that's great. You can add on to your expenses and programs later on, but at least you're covered. So your minimum amount is always covered. So that's what we do with scenario planning. And when you're doing your budget, it's good to actually have your cash flows uh, forecast as well, so that you kind of match your scenarios with your cash forecast so that you know that you're actually forecasting your cash is coming in at month three or six. So what are you going to do between month four and five? Do you have enough cash flows to cover those expenses and so on? So always your scenario planning goes with uh, cash uh, forecast as well. Um, so, and it's good to do that. Uh, you know, people, it's good to be very, very optimistic, but it's also, I mean, accountants live in the world of conservatism. So, you know, what's the worst case scenario? What's gonna happen? Are you gonna be able to pay your bills? Uh, you know, that kind of uh, situation has to be always thought about. And the board also needs to be a part of it. And, you know, uh, they need to be made aware of the different possibilities. And especially during COVID, it's very hard to kind of uh, anticipate what are the kind of unforeseen expenses you may have? So you may have a pool of like, you know, unexpected contingencies as one line item. Um, and you want that, you hope that you're gonna get the grant, but what happens if you get only 60% of it? Um, you know, so all these different scenarios need to be planned for and so that you're not in a shock when it actually happens. You've kind of prepared for it. Great. Um, I was just trying to put in the chat a little bit about some, I was seeing if you had a scenario planning um, tool on your website or anything like oh, that yes. that I uh, share with folks. Absolutely. So um, we have, um, an, okay. do I have cap cap capability to put it there? Yeah. I just put in there. So that's a link that takes to our, our rapid response. Uh, so. 
it, it includes scheduling a call with one of the consultants, but at the bottom of the page, there's a scenario planner and there's a revenue risk calculator as well. So all you need to do is put in your email and download uh, the template and put in the information that's relevant to your organization. Uh, it'll calculate the different scenarios for you and you know help you make decisions. So, so this is, um, you're, will you say a little more about the scheduling a call and what, what, what kind of services you offer? Yeah, so it's, uh, so on the same link that I sent, there is a, a button which tells you to schedule a call. So, you know, you, you're connected to a real estate consultant or financial consultant and you have a 45 minute discussions with them, talk about uh, any financial issues you're uh, dealing with, or, you know, if you have any real estate uh uh, issues coming up. Say, for example, you're running your lease is coming to an end, or you're looking for a new space. You want to acquire new things, and you just want to bounce off ideas, get strategies on that. Um, so that's a free to a 45 minute consultation call. Um, very easy to schedule. The different time slots, and as easy as two clicks of a button. My testimonial is I actually, I called you guys, which is part of how I um, connected with uh, these folks to when we were dealing with, um, you know, we were not using our office, but we were trying to negotiate with our landlord and we weren't sure what our options were with getting out of a lease or changing the terms of a lease. And you all were very helpful in walking us through that. So that's, that's something maybe some other people are dealing with. Um, having space they can no longer use and maybe never will use again if their business has changed or their nonprofit has changed enough due to COVID-19. So thank you. Of course, that's what we're here for. <laughs> um, I wonder if maybe, does, if, if anybody else has something to say, people are sort of trickling away a little bit. Um, if no one else has a question, I wonder if it's worth, because people are going in and out a lot. I'm sort of monitoring the thing. Maybe pull up, Aviva, if you're still listening, can you just pull up those slides again? And um, Shama could just do a little bit more of an overview of what Community Vision has to offer so that maybe if people were shy here in front of other people, they can still reach out and get the support they need. Is you hear Aviva for that? Oh, Aviva might not be listening. Yep, okay, they're gonna do it for us. Thank you, Aviva. Yeah, we're happy to answer any questions. And honestly, no question is too uh, silly. No question is too unimportant. Uh, everything is, and so we, we'll be happy to help with any. Great. Gaviva is working on it. I'm seeing that Aviva's, oh, there it is. You have a Shama as well? Yes. So you want me to talk about community vision again, or are you just putting up the my email address so that people can ask any questions directly if they want to? Um, just because people have come in and out a little bit, I thought it might be, yeah, whatever you'd like to do, just what making sure that people have the information so they can swing back to you all if, if, uh, if it suits them. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, if you want to go back a couple of slides, Aviva. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have different sections within our organization. So there's one section that's that's lending. So it does lend, lending for working capital and also long-term uh, needs. Um, you know, so for organizations that are deeply rooted in the community that need working capital uh, help, uh, you know, please do contact the lending department. They work with a lot of nonprofits. They come up with a great plan to ensure that, you know, the repayment schedule is, uh, easy and is for what the nonprofits need. Um, I already talked about the consulting and we do policy advocacy at the local state and at the national level, uh, but also for those uh, individuals who'd like to invest in um, 
projects which work in their communities. There's also the socially responsible investing fund that we have. And I believe uh, the investors are also paid interest annually at the end of the year. Um, so that's something that people could definitely check out if they have thousand dollars to invest and want to invest in socially responsible causes. Um, and yeah, so if there's anything else that I can help with, I'd be glad to. One last call out for questions, then I think we'll close out the session. All right, I wanna thank Shama so much for taking the time today to, to just riff on some topics and hope, hopefully get people excited to uh, thinking about what their own concerns are and to reach out to Community Vision to, to learn more and, and um, continue to grow their financial capacity, their organization. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks Rachel for having me and I appreciate uh, the opportunity. And uh, I know finance is not as exciting as other things, but as I was telling you earlier, it is a critical piece, a support function, which without which a lot of work cannot be done. So happy to help with any financial related questions. Uh, even if people want to email later, that's fine. That's great, thank you. And for folks who are still here, please um, please click in the Whova app and, and rate the session so we can learn more and, and continue to grow for future conferences. Thanks everybody. Thanks Rachel, bye.